Reveal Digital recently announced their editorial board's approval of a new collection to be developed under their Diversity and Dissent Digitization Fund. Listen in as Ithaca SNR's Kara Bledsoe hosts a roundtable discussion with Anne Ray, Maggie Kurkowski, and Peggy Glan on their vision for HIV, AIDS, and the arts. You're in the process of developing a new collection that's tentatively called HIV, AIDS, and the Arts. Where did the idea for this project originate? We are at the very beginning of building this. It's a new collection for Reveal Digital, and it actually has no online presence yet. So I think you all here in this, um, in this forum are hearing really about it in this level of detail for the first time, and Maggie's going to elaborate a little bit more. Um, but as far as the idea, you know, Reveal Digital has always been about protest and dissent um, and the alternative and often very difficult materials or and things that have slipped through the cracks or the significance of them is not yet well documented or hasn't been explored yet. Um, and so I, it, I thought of this idea in the midst of the pandemic um, when thinking kind of about how the pandemic we're in now might be historicized in the future. And then it just sort of suddenly hit me that AIDS and HIV are being historicized right now, often through the arts. Um, and I, I mean the arts broadly defined. So theater, drama, performance, visual art, of course, but also literature. Um, and I think now many are learning about the impact of AIDS and HIV through those. Um, through those artistic that artistic production and and there are a lot of sort of dominant narratives within that but even in my early stages of thinking of this idea I had the sense that were that there were lots of other voices um, that had yet to be heard or um, either because they were disappearing or because they hadn't been visible um, you know because of historic reasons um, and so I, I think that like the, um, you know, our interest in preservation really made me want to um, sort of dig in to that area and use what we can offer as Reveal Digital to preserve some of those voices. Um, so Maggie, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, um, you know, as Anne was saying, we are very much at the beginning of this process, which means that uh, we are both Active, uh, we are both actively in the process of finding sources that could contribute to a collection of this type, but also thinking really deeply about its mission and the way in its scope and how that will appear um, in its final platform. Um, I think it's important to us, as Anne was saying, to really highlight underrepresented voices, uh, not only from individuals in the United States, but also from a global perspective. Um, and that's something that we're very actively pursuing. That's so cool. I, so thinking expansively then, what kinds of materials are you including in this collection? Sure. So um, again, we're, I'm defining the arts very broadly. Um, so meaning any kind of artistic production, and that could mean it's going to be multidisciplinary, but also multi-content. Um, so that could mean, you know, artifacts, um, from visual arts, it could mean sheet music, it could mean manuscripts, it could mean, um, you know, uh, scripts, uh, sheet music, all manner of things. Um, and I think the other thing I would just add about the way we're thinking of what materials will go in is that we're going to be relying on an advisory panel um, and talking to lots of people firsthand. So kind of sort of building off about what I said before about trying to um, be a vehicle for what others might have done um, in their archiving work. Um, we want to hear from other experts about what they believe should be included. Um, and so we're really trying to, to do that research and incorporate it, um, especially as we were saying from an international perspective. Um, and so maybe actually, Maggie, would you want to show um, and elaborate a little on some of the things we've been finding and that we hope to include? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so like Anne was saying, uh, these particular materials are kind of part of our wish list. They're potential items that might be in the collection, um, but they're not items for which that we've secured, you know, the copyright or, you know, the permission to publish ourselves. Um, but I think they should give you a good sense of the range of materials and artifacts that we're looking for. Um, you know, oftentimes when we see the output of an artist, 
Um, it's the finished product. It's, you know, what they are showing to the world in a museum, on a stage. Um, and I think we're very interested in collecting the type of materials that show the artist process and sort of the communities that they were part of as they, um, as these, as their artistic work, as their uh, communities relate to and grappled with the crisis of HIV and AIDS. Um, so one of the artists we're interested in is a uh, Chicago born Essex Hemphill, um, who passed away in 1995 of complications from AIDS. Um, he was a poet who sort of dealt very openly with the effect of um, HIV and AIDS on his community um, in a period of time when this was still a crisis in the United States um, that was not receiving much national or um, political attention. Um, and so he was really instrumental in sort of moving towards an awareness of HIV and AIDS. Um, and so his papers are now housed in the New York Public Library collections. And so that's the type of uh, item that we would be looking for. Um, we're also looking outside the United States, as I said before. Um, so pictured here is a still from um, the play, um, an autobiographical play by Patty Chu, um, who was the first person from Singapore to come out openly um, with a HIV or AIDS diagnosis. Um, you know, and so his experiences are very much represented in his work. And that is sort of something that we're looking for is a real sense of the artists and, you know, how they themselves understood uh, HIV. So here we have a more recent piece. Um, this is by uh, a sculptor, Dr. Lillian uh, Mary Nabuline. Um, so this is a piece in wood from her 2017 series, uh, Uniqueness of Campus Girls. And she's an artist who really thinks deeply about the ongoing HIV and AIDS crisis as it affects uh, women and girls, particularly in her home country of Uganda. Um, and so, her materials, we haven't identified a specific group of papers that we can use to talk about her work, um, talk about her artistic process, her teaching. She is a professor, um, but it's something that we're actively seeking out to try to understand sort of the larger uh, environment that she's working in, in addition to her individual experiences. Um, and finally, this is um, a still from a piece by Peter Minshall who is a carnival artist um, from Trinidad. And so he used this particular genre as a way to raise um, awareness of HIV and AIDS in his communities. And so I actually learned about his, that his papers um, exist in physical form in a World War II era hangar. Um, so they're among the larger archives, the, the Kalaloop Theater Company in uh, Trinidad. And, you know, I really think one of the exciting aspects of this project with Reveal Digital is that we have the capacity to help sort of underserved or um, uh, undigitized uh, groups of material receive the resources they need in order to become digitized. And so we, we're not, as we're collecting this material, we're not entirely relying on, um, papers, materials that have already sort of found a place on the internet. Um, and this really helps us sort of expand to try our best to represent as many sort of groups, communities, artists as possible that sort of fall under the scope of HIV, AIDS and the arts. Um, so with that in mind, um, and as we've said a few times during this presentation, we're really actively collecting materials and trying to learn as much as we can from you know, people who know things um, and who study deeply um, the very issues that we've been talking about. Um, so we invite you, um, if this presentation has sort of sparked uh, the name of a specific artist or the name of a work that you think would help make this collection the best collection it can be, um, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we are very actively collecting and we're very interested in hearing more from you.
Cool, cool. And you'll share your contact information at the end, right? Absolutely. Can, like, reach you. Okay, great. Um, um, Maggie, you mentioned that Reveal is interested in documenting the creative process in addition to the final works. Um, how is archival work similar to the process of creating? Um, and are there challenges to Reveal's work because the creators of these materials are creative practitioners? Mm. I can answer that one quickly first. I, you know, as I, as you're, you mentioned in the bio, I'm a, a fiction writer in my, in the other side of my life. Um, and I suppose that from my point of view, the way that it's, that the archiving and the archival practice is similar to creative work is that there's, uh, especially with fiction, there's a, a process of drafting and redrafting. Um, and I think that there's also, especially within fiction also, or maybe with any artistic production, there's a sort of um, uh, an underlying question of why. Why this story? Why now? Why is this a thing that people need to hear about? And why does it need to exist in this form? Um, and I guess for me, that definitely resembles like the creation of narrative drive. Um, and I like the idea that that same kind of question of why can can be like a, um, you know, sort of a driver to to um, force us as archivists um, to really think about the scope and about the, the value and the story we're trying to tell. Great, great. Um, and so then is the lack of completeness and the collection, is that like a criticism or a strength from that perspective and why? So this is a question that we grapple with. Um, and I think it's a fascinating question um, kind of throughout the entire process here. Um, and I think it's important for us to just sort of acknowledge the fact that the, what we create is not going to be comprehensive. Um, it's not going to be a sort of like catalog raisonne of all of the arts worldwide that have been produced in response to HIV and AIDS. Um, and I guess from my point of view, the absences in the archive are gonna be as important as what's included. Um, and, and I suppose from my point of view, what, what I see this archive accomplishing um, is sort of like laying down pathways for, um, you know, for people to do further exploration and to sort of seek further unknowns um, about using what might be, what they perceive as absent from the archive. Um, I think that also such a really broad scope as what we're doing allows um, in some ways like the big broad networks between disciplines and between individuals to be shown. Um, and I think it also will allow scholars um, to explore kind of within those absences. Um, and, you know, I think also the, it kind of has to be incomplete necessarily in some ways because artistic production in relationship to HIV and AIDS is ongoing and whether or not it's revealed digital that preserves the future canon, um, you know, that kind of remains to be seen, but there's a future to the subject as far as that artistic production, absolutely. Um, and then I think the other thing that came to mind about completeness is that, you know, it's a question about consent. Um, you know, in, in many ways, in most ways, in all ways, I suppose, this is a community archive that we're building. And so consent from the individuals, from the institutions holding the material is absolutely 100% necessary. So there may be people who determine that they don't want to work with us. And that is absolutely um, a part of our process. And so for that reason, we can't, we can't include something if someone does not give their consent. Um, and I don't know, um, if there's anything else, Maggie, you wanted to add on to either of those two questions that, that Kara posed to us. Um, I think, you know, you sort of approach the creative practice of the collection as a creative writer. Um, coming with my background in art history, I often think of it in terms of curatorial work. Um, which in many ways is about directing attention. You know, it's selecting specific resources and giving them a platform and the right type of contextual information where people can perhaps see them in a new light or see them for the first time. And I think, you know, our ability to bring attention to some of these people who have been putting in the work um, and responding to 
HIV to AIDS, to medicine access, to discrimination, to racism, to all the various ideas that sort of surround HIV, AIDS and the arts is really um, where we can make the choices that shape the collection. I was thinking, um, Maggie, when you were talking about um, giving like resources to collections that like wanna be digitized, there's like this very like sensitive conversation around like the, what seems like a compulsion to like digitize everything. Mm -hmm. um, and like how that's tied to like vocational awe is like this term of like, oh, like archivists, digital archiving, it's like inherently a good thing. Like we should do this for everything. So it was really great to hear like this other perspective from Anne, which is like complimentary ultimately about how like it is a part of Reveal's process to like, like acknowledge and accept when someone like, or like a collection, whoever is like in charge of those materials chooses not to engage with you guys. So I think having those two parts was really important. Cause like when you were first saying that Maggie, I was like, ooh, it's not really, but like, I understand mm -hmm. more now, like, like with that comment coming later, exactly. how those things connect. And I together. also, Sarah, I, I definitely share your concerns about sort of this push to digitize, um, particularly when they're, the main reason for digitizing is the fact that it will be digitizing, it becomes kind of this recursive loop. Um, mm -hmm. Part of the reason I think that this collection is most powerful as a digital one, and it's a feature and a that's integral to the work as opposed to sort of a, um, you know, something that's done to sort of follow the zeitgeist mm -hmm. is because these are materials and ideas and artists who, you know, otherwise would never be able to share the same space. You know, this isn't simply taking a pre-existing archive and then transferring it to the internet. This is thinking very carefully about what materials really can speak to each other that otherwise never would have the chance to speak to each other. And the only way that can happen while still preserving sort of the, the physical records and allowing them to flourish where they are is by creating this sort of third zone, this, this other digital zone where they can all come together in conversation. I think it's all about like, what value does it provide to digitize mm -hmm. these materials? It's not just yes. making something available online just because you can, but yes. like, like enabling or facilitating all these materials from all these different places, different perspectives to be in conversation mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. That's really incredible. Yeah, exactly. It's really integral to the project, I would say. Sorry, right. Anne. And then the, the sort of the Reveal Digital's way of working is to, again, sort of provide this vehicle, right? We make no judgments about whether or not people may want to be a part of it or not. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's available <laughs> to all if that makes sense. And then the funds that we raise are used in that way um, with, with a certain amount of like parity, if that makes sense. And, and Peggy, you mentioned, right? Like these, all of these collections are open access, right? Right. Your days are okay. Yeah, so that's where sometimes the challenge comes in or the advantage, depending on who you're mm -hmm. working with. Um, in our experience, there have been organizations who held the copyright for material that worked with us specifically because we were going to be open access and they weren't contributing their content to something that was ultimately going to be a for-profit venture. Uh, and then there are others who, that piece of it isn't as important. They uh, are, are approaching a collection like this, wanting to share in the revenue that comes in to cover the costs and they want to participate in that part of it. And ultimately our, our model doesn't work well that way to, to pay royalty back for participating, allowing your material to be in a collection. Right, so, and I would just jump in really quickly to say that yeah. there, are, if that's what an entity or organization or individual wanted to do, there are lots of other organizations that do that. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the right. space that we were attempting to occupy. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time to learn about HIV, AIDS, and the arts. We are at the very beginning of this project and welcome your comments, suggestions, and ideas.
If your library has material that you think would be a good fit, we want to hear from you too. Please get in touch using the contact information provided here.